what one notices is the effort and the initiatives that communities, local people, traditional or indigenous, ethnic minorities, and their relationship with land and resources, and the types of local governance systems that they have come out about with it, the customary norms and practices uh, in Indonesia, the whole Seswai uh, Degan Adat, the Adat way, or customary practices and norms. But then you also have a situation where you have the conflict and dominance of a certain type of legal system, more in the statutory positivistic uh, sense. Uh, on the other hand, you've got this struggle, you've got uh, communities and indigenous people that have struggled and fought back and pushed both the state as well as industries and companies further back. Uh, but what do all of these things mean? Uh, what type of resolution can we come about? To what extent are the status and our engagement with, water, with rights really point out to? How is it related to poverty alleviation, to environmental integrity and sustainability, to, uh, let's say, sustainable livelihoods? What are some of those fundamental struggles that we engage in? How do we conceptualize and operationalize and see this situation of historicity, this relational uh, between humans and nature, as well as between communities, state, market, community uh, relationship? So I'd like to turn to our colleagues of the panel to sort of introduce us to this array of this complexity and dynamics. We have in the panel uh, a member coming in from the government research site, another from a more coalition and network site, yeah? another more as a scholar activist, but really looking at the whole range of issues. And in presenting some of the struggles, some of the incidents, uh, you know, we get a better sense of what is going on. We also have uh, our uh, regent, uh, you know, our Bhupati, really showing what it means to be a head of a district and to govern and to work together with others. And what are some of the political space that one can uh, look at and then explore? So without much ado, I would like to request uh, uh, Dr. Ganga Dahal to start his presentation on the overview of forest tenure in. Asia, then we'll follow that with uh, Pabupati. Uh, Paganga, please. And some of the relative position of the countries in Asia and some key lessons and ways forward. Next, please. So the sources and methodology. Uh, Rights and Resources Initiative started a series of publication uh, research, uh, analysis on various uh, issues related to tenure and rights. So the the latest one that those are used here are basically three publications. One is What Future for Reform? That is very recent publication uh, by Rights and Resources Initiative 2014. The Land Owners or Laborers, the publication was in 2013. And What Rights? A comparative analysis was done on forest tenure rights looking on 54 countries uh, across Asia, Africa, and Latin America. That was in 2012. Those three are the major uh, sources that those are used in this presentation. Uh, while doing analysis, actually, it was based on stat statutory data collected from uh, 52 countries, as I mentioned earlier, across Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And all data were triangulated from various sources. It's not only the government sources, but other sources were also taken into consideration to make sure that the validity of the data. Next, please. Uh, in terms of framework, what we have been using is here uh, basically the two major categories of total forest land ownership, if you divide it, those are basically either public or private. If you look on the public, again, those are subdivided into two subcategories. Uh, one is legally administered by the government, all control uh, by the government itself. The state is the one making all decisions on that. Uh, the second category under public domain is basically the legally designated for use uh, by communities and indigenous groups. That is what a 
public part of the uh, category in that public domain. And the second uh, domain is basically private. When you talk about the private, it includes uh, legally owned by individual and firms and or legally owned by communities and indigenous groups. Those are all uh, uh, falls under the private uh, categories or private domain of uh, the land tenure uh, categories. Next, please. Uh, very quickly, as if you look on this global overview, actually uh, communities own and control uh, over forest land uh, has been increasing. Uh, so, but still, if you look on this global data, only 12.6% of the total forest land is owned by communities or controlled by communities. Uh, over the past decades, there has been uh, increase in uh, the, the coverage and the millions of hectares uh, some figures I have put here actually 128 million hectares in the last decades uh, has uh, increased has been increased under these categories. It means the communities own forest land. Uh, it is also because the indigenous people and local communities had, has been uh, very much vocal and uh, in terms of advocating their rights through different uh, international uh, uh, forum and uh, mechanism like UN DRIP. Uh, FPIC and volunteer guidelines, the very uh, the recent one that EFAO developed. Uh, there has been progress, but in, in spite of the progress, a slowdown in recognition uh, has been noticed since 2008. If you compare the 2002 to 2008, uh, the progress was a bit uh, positive in terms of uh, the scale, but the, the progress is slowing down since 2008. I'll be discussing why it is and what is the status. Next, please. Uh, these are this uh, range of regime under various, uh, uh, you know, forest management system in various countries uh, across Asia, Africa, and Latin America. I don't want to go on each and every, but uh, what it is is basically uh, when you talk about the tenure, it is a bundle of rights. However, uh, the limited rights are recognized in almost all regime. Either there are management rights or use rights given, but there is hardly any alienation rights given under uh, those regimes that we have studied in 54 countries. Next, please. Look at the forest tenure transition, uh, 2002 to 2013, that we have the latest data. Uh, you can see there is a decrease in the total uh, forest area administered by government from 77.9, almost 78, to back to 73 percent in 2013. However, uh, the area under uh, designated for indigenous people and communities increased slightly, 1.5 to 2.9, which is not a significant increase. And the same is with the owned by indigenous people and uh, communities also increased slightly from uh, 9.8 to 12.6. Uh, owned by firms and individuals also very insignificant in number 10.9 to 11.9. It means that almost uh, more than 70% of the total forest land is under state ownership and control. Uh, next please. Uh, I have another slide here just to look on what is the situation with the uh, low and middle income countries, which is a little bit different than the global scenario. If you look on this again, uh, low and middle income countries, uh, the progress is a bit significant. For example, the designated for indigenous people and communities coming from 3 to 6.1, almost 50% uh, increase in the uh, total uh, areas under that categories. And similar is the case with uh, owned by indigenous people and communities. Uh, and with the owned by firms and individuals, which is a bit different than global scenario. I just want to uh, show the comparison. Next, please. Now, we can see that there is an uneven progress between the region. It's not that all regions are having the same level of progress. They have different context and, you know, the different scenario. When you look at the Latin America, so we can see that the blue part, 43%, is uh, under government or the state control forest land tenures. Uh, system, whereas 33% is uh, owned by indigenous people and communities. It looks like kind of a balance in Latin American countries, whereas Africa almost all owned by uh, state. There is hardly any percentage uh, that is given to the local communities as a ownership. In Asia, is in between Africa and Latin America, in fact, 
uh, we can see that 60% is uh, still uh, government ownership and 30% and if you combine with the 6% owned by indigenous people, uh, sorry, uh, communities, then it will be 36%. So which is moving forward in a positive direction in Asia. So it is a comparison. We can just see that Africa, Asia, and Latin America, uh, uh, the first line uh, includes the status in 2002, and then bottom one includes the status in 2013. We can compare. Uh, we can see that there is no significant changes in Africa and um, Asia, but a uh, bit good level of progress made in Latin America. Next, please. Yeah, as well. So in many countries in Asia, there is still a political will, and the government always prefer to the protection-oriented uh, area expansion, uh, which limit the you know the scope of forest and reform uh, in many countries in Asia. Uh, it is also important uh, and realize that tenure policy enable environment for a private sector investment because once the security of tenure is clear, then private investor would be happy enough and comfortable to do any sort of investment in the forest sectors. If there is no tenure security, then definitely private sector will be, you know, uh, unwilling to invest. Next, please. Uh, it is also realized that uh, from the cases across globe and also in some of the countries in Asia that uh, recognition of the an ancestral territory, the domain of indigenous people, uh, could reduce the conflict. Some of the example we can see the example of India in, you know, north northern part of India. The very recent tribal and ethnic minorities were given their tribal domain uh, as a own uh, by those tribal peoples under the very recent Forest Right Act. Uh, so that create an environment to reduce the conflict uh, on, on going there in northern part of India. There are many other cases in other countries as well. Uh, in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, uh, it, it has been uh, from the you know analysis, it shows that actually community-based forest management regime has proved as one of the viable options to ensure rights and also get benefit from forest resource management. So there is still a huge scope of forest land tenure reform in many countries in Asia. Although progress, as I mentioned earlier, is slow, but a strong hope is still there. We need to be positive. Uh, that's what way forward, I think. So, and also it is important, some of the pictures I have uh, taken from Africa and Asia, that how forest could contribute for the livelihood and economic development, uh, which is the next immediate uh, challenge for us to make sure that the forest resources benefit to all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dengaji. Dengan... Uh, Judul Strategi Penanggulangan Kemiskinan Melalui Pengelolaan Hutan Berbasis Masyarakat di Kabupaten Baru Perkenalkan kami adalah Bupati dari salah satu kabupaten di Sulawesi Selatan Kebetulan sekali Profesi kami adalah Forestry atau Forester Sarjana Kehutanan Kami latar belakang dari Sarjana Kehutanan Jadi profesi adalah Forester Kalau Bupati cuma hobi Bapak dan Ibu hadirin sekalian yang saya hormati Bahwa Kabupaten Baru adalah Salah satu kabupaten dengan luas kurang lebih 125 ribu hektar, Kurang lebih 63 persen adalah merupakan kawasan hutan dengan jumlah penduduk kurang lebih 165 ribu jiwa. Pada tahun 2012 yang lalu, jumlah masyarakat miskin yang ada di Kabupaten Baru adalah kurang lebih 9,28 persen atau secara nominal adalah 15 ribu jiwa lebih. Bapak-Ibu hadirin sekalian yang saya hormati, Kabupaten Baru mempunyai visi dalam penyelenggaraan pemerintahan dan pembangunan 
adalah kita berharap Kabupaten Baru yang lebih maju, sejahtera, taat asas, bermartabat, dan yang bernapaskan keagamaan. Oleh karenanya, dalam penyelenggaraan pemerintahan dan pembangunan, ada empat pendekatan yang kami lakukan. Yang pertama adalah bagaimana menciptakan pertumbuhan ekonomi, kemudian mengentaskan kemiskinan, membuka lapangan kerja, dan juga membangun dengan berwawasan lingkungan. Itu pendekatan yang kita lakukan dan atau kita jabarkan dalam lima misi. Lima misi yaitu meningkatkan kualitas manusia, mengoptimalkan pemanfaatan sumber daya pembangunan untuk kesejahteraan masyarakat, menciptakan lingkungan yang kondusif, mengembangkan interkoneksitas sinergis antar wilayah di tingkat nasional, regional, dan internasional, dan yang kelima adalah mewujudkan tata pemerintahan yang baik atau good governance. Beberapa strategi yang kami lakukan, ada lima, Bapak dan Ibu sekalian bisa melihat pada tayangan dan berikut. Dan yang lebih penting adalah bahwa mungkin Panitia mengundang kami untuk membawakan makalah ini karena adanya kebijakan dari pemerintah kabupaten khususnya dalam pengentasan kemiskinan. Khususnya dalam pemanfaatan sumber daya alam hutan yang ada di Kabupaten Baru. Bapak Ibu hadirin sekalian yang saya hormati, pada beberapa waktu yang lalu, sebenarnya masyarakat memandang kebijakan pemerintah terhadap pengelolaan hutan itu tidaklah berpihak kepada rakyat. Kenapa? Bahwa Kebijakan pemerintah dalam pengelolaan hutan sangat berpihak kepada bagaimana hutan ini dapat dijaga, dikonservasi tanpa memperhatikan, tanpa memperhatikan kebutuhan masyarakat yang ada di sekitar hutan. Di Kabupaten Baru dapat kami sampaikan kepada Bapak dan Ibu sekalian bahwa hampir 90 persen dari masyarakat Kabupaten Baru bersentuhan dengan kawasan hutan. Dan hampir 90 persen dari masyarakat miskin yang ada di Kabupaten Baru adalah masyarakat yang berada di sekitar kawasan hutan. Oleh karenanya pada beberapa waktu yang lalu kami selaku bupati telah menerbitkan suatu peraturan bupati terhadap 17 satuan kerja pemerintah daerah agar pada setiap tahun mengalokasikan anggaran untuk pengentasan masyarakat miskin yang ada di Kabupaten Baru secara keseluruhan. Kebetulan saja bahwa masyarakat miskin itu berlokasi atau bermukim di sekitar kawasan hutan. Secara konsisten, pemerintah Kabupaten telah mentuangkan ini dalam dokumen perencanaan jangka panjang, jangka menengah, dan juga pada penyelenggaraan anggaran pada setiap tahunnya. Bapak Ibu hadirin sekalian yang kami hormati, dalam beberapa tahun terakhir ini, 
melalui peraturan Bupati ini Alhamdulillah masyarakat khususnya yang berada di sekitar kawasan hutan telah banyak dapat memanfaatkan sumber daya hutan ini dengan baik secara lestari dan dengan bekerja sama dengan pemerintah apakah itu melalui pengembangan hutan kemasyarakatan hutan rakyat hutan desa dan juga berbagai model yang merupakan kearifan kearifan lokal dari masyarakat kita di Kabupaten Baru untuk itu maka sasaran daripada pembangunan kami di Kabupaten Baru dalam tahun 2015 yang akan datang kami berharap bahwa jumlah masyarakat miskin di Kabupaten Baru Insya Allah akan berada di bawah 9 persen akan berada di bawah 9 persen yang mana telah kami cantumkan di dalam rencana pembangunan jangka menengah Kabupaten Baru ini yang dapat kami sampaikan kepada Bapak dan Ibu sekalian oleh karenanya kami berharap bahwa hadirin sekalian mungkin dapat berkunjung ke Kabupaten Baru agar supaya apa yang telah kami lakukan di sana dapat lebih disempurnakan lagi dan atau dapat kita jadikan Kabupaten Baru ini sebagai lokus penelitian atau lokus pengembangan hutan yang berpihak kepada masyarakat atau berpihak kepada pengentasan ekonomi kerakyatan atau peningkatan kesejahteraan masyarakat yang ada di sekitar hutan kami menunggu dan mengundang Bapak dan Ibu sekalian untuk berkunjung ke Kabupaten Baru kebetulan bahwa Bupatinya itu juga sama dengan Bapak dan Ibu sekalian adalah Rimbawan atau Porester jadi profesinya adalah eh, Porester Bupatinya cuma hobi-hobi saja hobi saja Welcome to Baru kepada Bapak dan Ibu sekalian. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I wanted to draw your attention uh, to the fact that uh, post 98 after the fall of uh, we had quite a bit of economic and political reforms that led to decentralization, devolution of authority. I mean, here is a case where we can see what it means in terms of governing a particular area within this larger context of decentralization, and also looking at state-locality relationship and some of the uh, you know, imperatives in terms of governing a particular situation and how the different machineries both at the government level and at the locality level sort of move on. What is in Indonesia? Next, please. So, unclear or, or insecure tenor might directly trigger the deforestation and forest degradation as forest users might feel that they do not have a stake to, to the forest. And in the case of uh, state forests, in the especially in a developing countries like Indonesia, the government who controls the forest usually do not have a capacity. I mean, they lack the capacity to, to protect the vast forest resources. Just like uh, uh, Ganga said, there's 97% of forest in Indonesia administered by, by the government. It's about uh, 130-something uh, million hectares. It's, you can imagine the, the vast forest resources. So, encroachment... Uh, uh, usually happen in Indonesia and illegal activities because of the, the lack of the capacity to monitor them. While the involvement of local communities in managing forest resources is still low, we'll see how 
it's uh, happening in Indonesia. Next. So the objective of the, uh, the presentation actually is analyzing the current institutional arrangement of forest management in Indonesia in determining the access of our local communities to state forests and to examining the existing option to strengthen the involvement of local communities in state forest management. Next, let's see the, the situation um, in, in Indonesia. Uh, it is in line with the, uh, the, the first presentation say that about uh, most of the uh, forest in Indonesia are administered by, by the, the state and it is classified into three different functions of forest, which is a production forest, the protection forest, and conservation forest. So about uh, 128 million hectares are administered by or governed by the, the, the government, which is uh, under the uh, responsibility of the Ministry of Forestry. I put the terrestrial here, because in Indonesia, forests can also include the, the marine or more wetland. That not, uh, um, uh, this, uh, this is uh, related to the, the conservation area. So I put only the, the terrestrial one because it, it may be more uh, related to the, how the community can access the forest. Next. <clears throat> Let us... Um, See what, what happened in, on the ground. About the 22.25 million hectare, which is a conservation forest, is managed by the government agencies, the Ministry of Forestry or local forestry services, about 70%. And 33.9 million hectare, which is a, in a production forest, or some of them in, in a protection forest, are managed by forest concession companies, which is 26%. So they the left is about 72 million hectares have not been managed under any institutional arrangement, meaning that it's still under the uh, administri administration of the state or the, or the government, but has not been you know, licensed to, to anyone. So the, the question is, is there the opportunities for local communities to access that forest or not? And I put this figure without... Um, uh, considering the, the constitutional court decree, the latest constitutional court decree that has been excluded uh, customary forest in, uh, as a state forest because it has not been fully operated on the ground. Next, please. Uh, let's see the, the community's right of forest resources. The current area of community-based forest management can be classified into community forest, which is in Indonesia, it's... Uh, called the HKM, or Hutan Kemasyarakatan, which Pak Bupati said about how the community forest in Baru has been operated. And the customary forest, which is um, a Hutan Adat. That in, in, in reality, there is no formal customary forest in Indonesia because it has not been, there is no, no customary forest has been, you know, just like decreed or acknowledged by the central government. The initiative has been there. Uh, the Bupati or the governor can, uh, has already acknowledged the, the customary forest on the ground. And, but in, real, in the formal term, there is no customary forest until the constitutional court said that the customary forest is not the state forest. The third um, option to uh, have a right or access for the community to uh, to forest, to, to step forest is the, through the community plantation forest or HTR, Hutan Tanaman Rakyat. And the four is with the village forest or Hutan Desa. The latest data so that the, the community's rights or the community access to the step forest is only about the 270,000 hectares, more or less like that. This is only less than 1% of the total area of the step forest that. Uh, we, we already mentioned before. Next. Let us uh, try to imagine the household living inside and surrounding state forests. The study in 15 provinces in 2007 uh, have been, uh, revealed, uh, has revealed that about 20% of households in Indonesia living in a state forest or near state forests. 
if we calculate the number of households in Indonesia, it's about 91 million uh, uh, household. And so, uh, of course, the, 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 as we're assuming that with the normal distribution or something like that, but just, just keep in mind that it's only the, the assumption that the household insect and surrounding state forest should be in the t about 12, 12 million something household. And if those households are given use rights or whatever the right is to manage uh, state forest about two hectares at least, and we will have a 24.4 million hectare of uh, forest that can be managed by the local communities. So it will be uh, relevant to our political changes through the decentralization or devolution of of uh, managing resources, and also it will also increase the equity of uh, uh, resource utilization to, uh, for, for Indonesia, not only um, dominated by uh, a certain amount or a, a small amount of, a, small, a few of parties that can access and utilize and get benefit from, from, from the forest resources. Next, please. And let me talk about the rise of formal customary forest. I put the formal customary forest because the customary forest has, has been there even before the Constitutional Court uh, has uh, decreed to exclude the, the customary forest from the state forest classification. So uh, with the Constitutional Court that has issued the decree to exclude to exclude customary forests from the state forest classification, it means that there is an opportunity for the local communities, especially the customary communities, to have a right, their rights acknowledged and also to have a, a more secure tenure of the forest resources. Um, however, the implementation of the decree has not been able to clarify the existence of customary rights of land and forest resources until now, because we still need uh, 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 a legal framework that can make the implementation of the, the, the decree uh, work, uh, can, the, the, the implementation of, 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 of the decree can work. Now, so we, it needs to coordinate action among parties, especially the Ministry of Forestry who has uh, manage the state forest for a long time ago, and the customary communities who, uh, in some part, they are still uh, a formal, uh, uh, formally uh, the jury and de facto. I, I think this would be a wonderful segue into the next presentation by Pao Oji, basically looking at the status of indigenous ownership of our customary territories in Indonesia, and he will also talk about the constitutional court decree and the ramifications and implications and what all we need to uh, look at. Uh, Pao Oji? Owned by indigenous communities slash local communities. And the number is zero. Zero. Yeah, um, time by time, the number is consistent, zero. Um, so as a person who move around to the rural area, especially visit the indigenous communities, I asked some indigenous leaders about who own this forest. And they, of course, they said, we are here, we are the owner of the customary territory and the state come later to, to us, okay? So the question is how the Indonesian government has no data on it. And then later, Dr. Ganga Dahal exposed the number is zero because the Indonesian government has no data and the customary territory and the owner of the customary territory has been invisible. The invisibility is the key here. 
Why? They are invisible. Because in the low, low number 49, 1999, and the previous lows, number 5, 1967, and in the previous lows, in the forest loan, 1865, in the colonial times, the customary territories has been categorized as state-owned land, state-owned forest. So based on that categorization, the central governments, the authorities, has legal yeah, authority to allocate the state land, state forest, to somebody else, to the forest agency, to the plantations, to the mining companies, and so on and so forth. So the problem is when you are, as the um, constitutional court judge, and got a request from indigenous communities, from the organization named AMAN, Aliansi Masyarakat Nusantara, that you know, request the constitutional court to test the constitutionality of this ownership status of the customary territory. What the decision you will make? So my presentation is about that, about a post-colonial decisions made by constitutional court. Go ahead. Hello? <laughs> yeah? So, um, this is the structure of my presentation, and go on. And, you know, don't confuse with number. The number, yeah, um, the original court ruling is number is number 35, PUU slash, you know, um, 2012. 2012 is number when they registered the request to the constitutional court. But the decision was released 16 May last year, 2013. So the court made a decision because of the request by Aman, right? And the decision was there are some articles within the forestry law are inconstitutional are inconstitutional. We only have few experience as a nation that the practice of the Indonesian government based on a particular article of law were defined as inconstitutional. After the long period of the land grabbing, this is the term from the, from the victim side or from the activists, they call it land grabbing, yeah, for, for, from the long run grabbing, now we realize, wow, constitutionally wrong it was. So when I got, you know, read the rulings, I thought, wow, what the state is this? The largest, you know, um, the largest state land holder in Indonesia, which is the Ministry of Forestry, did something wrong constitutionally since the beginning. So as, as a citizen, I was shaken when I read that. I had, you know, the state that did something wrong inconstitutionally. What should we do with that? Go on, please. And of course, we can learn academically about the articles. I, can, I cannot go in detail because of the time. And go on, please. And when I asked the judge, yeah, this one of the judge, he was retired now, and I asked, why you decide so? Why you made the Indonesian state so badly, in my view. And they said, this is the time to do um, correction. In my term, this is what they call it as undoing. 
discriminatory category embedded in Indonesian national law. I repeat it again. This is undoing against the discriminatory category embedded in Indonesian national law. Unfortunately, we don't have in, in, in Bahasa Indonesia the term for undoing. Tell me, tell me. We don't have it. I am a person who work with a publishing company and I have the term for that. We call it ralat. But not in, not in the legal literature. We don't have it. So he said that, look at that. When such defective laws, including the forestry law, are enforced, it will create social injustices. Enforcing such defective natural resource laws will endanger the existence of indigenous communities who are vulnerable to be excluded by those who are, have power in the name of the state or by permission of the state institutions. Well, well I, I go deeply, Pazenal, eh? Pazenal introduced that, but I'm, I'm, I'm grammatizing it. Okay? I'm grammatizing it. In order to make this sense, it's not light. No, no, this is not light. This is heavy. Okay, go on. So, why is this heavy? Because there are so many what I call systemic land conflict everywhere. Yeah? Pak Bupati, probably, if you sit on the table in your office, you cannot find the conflicts. I have five minutes. Yeah. But over there, there are so many land conflicts. That's important that to realize that the conflict is structural, the conflict is um, widespread. Go on. And how we understand the court ruling if we have an understanding about this systemic land conflict. Go on. So this is my argument. Yeah. You know, the ruling has provided an opportunity to fix the status of Indonesian indigenous communities as right-bearing subject. And the owner of their customary territory, which would be a popular move. That's my first argument. In the ruling, if you read it, there is a new term that was introduced. Never been has an official term. If you go to glossarium of the Indonesian law, you can have it, this one. The term is penyandang hak. We have the term penyandang cacat. Yeah? If somebody has a, you know accident and then he cannot work except by some instrument, probably she or he was called penyandang cacat. Of if I buy it, yeah, I have some money to give money and then made the people to demonstrate in front of your office that I was called as penyandang dana of the demonstration, right? <laughs> but for, for, for the right-bearing subject, for the penyandang hak, we don't have it. And the indigenous community, masyarakat, was not categorized as right-bearing subject. They are not penyandang hak. And the constitutional court ruling made a bold statement that the masyarakat hukum adat is penyandang hak. They are the owner of the customary territory. So the ruling at the same time has opened up the possibility for changing the trajectory of systemic agrarian conflicts which are chronic and widespread in the Indonesian archipelago. So the, the conflict will change. Go on. I will, I will move fast and please click fastly. Yeah? <coughs> this is the conflict. We, we know that you know, from the plantations, concessions, from the forest concession, mining concession, conservation concessions, transmigration, they will change the property relation, land use, and local livelihood. Go on. And, of course, the productions is different because there's change of the commodity supplies, supply for the world export, for the commodity consumption, and so on, including for keeping environmental services intact. Go on. So, Aman. 
I don't want to tell about Aman more, but we know that Aman played a big role in submitting the re judicial review to the court. And why Aman did that? Because Aman has no uh, understanding about the politics that, you know, adjustment politics. No, no, Aman did something radical here to put the Indonesian constitution work to review the Indonesian national law, which is the forestry law number 41, 1999. Go on, go on, go on, go on. This is the post what I call as a post-colonial territorialization of state control over forest. And it started since 1865, when the, you know, Undang-Undang Kehutanan Jawa dan Madura uh, made a statement that the whole forest territory are owned by the state. And then, because of that, there is establishment of the boundaries. And because of the establishment of boundaries, they create some kind of functional territorialization. This is for the conservation, this is for production, this is for blah, blah, blah. And then, state institution create the license. And then, when somebody like the Perusahaan HTI has a license, they have to create from the license become concession. From the paper become the territorial control. And then when they found there is a community within it, they have to kick them out. <laughs> yeah, of course. And it's violently. And there is a, a, a government regulation that says that in 1980s, like, similar like that. If the constitutional concession holder find a community within or surrounded the area, they have to, an authority to make it become discipline and make it become under the control to make it this concession work. Go on. So the conflict is everywhere. Go. And this is the thing. When I learn about this and deeply thinking theoretically, I come into this conclusion that every kind of you know, struggle for social justice has to deal with the discriminatory category. We have to change that category. And this is the purpose of the social movement. And, you know, because the categorical distinctions, that's, that, that's something that makes the inequality durable. And, this is final word, final word. How to make the inequality not continue anymore, and later, next year after the president, the new president was elected, yeah, probably the number, Dr. Ganga Dahal, the number will change from zero to Okay. Two. You can feel it. Thank you very much. Uh, OG, uh, you know, uh, some basically say this is righting the wrong. Okay. Uh, but anyway, let's hear from our colleagues and friends here. Uh, we'll take five questions, comments, observations. Please. Uh, state your name and all that. Let's go from this side. Anyone from here? One, two. Katarina oh. from Red Bus Agency. Um, a very uh, interesting presentation from all of the speakers, but my question specifically for the first speakers. Um, uh, you mentioned toward the end of your presentation that there is a positive correlation between securing the rights with the uh, let's say, a better environmental management or um, something similar to that. Uh, because uh, most of the presentation uh, showing, um, you know, the percentage of uh, land ownership by the IPs and communities in general, I would like to know whether your research specifically showing, for example, China, uh, whether their management for the environment is actually better and whether that is... Um, the contribution of the you know, higher percentage of land that is owned by communities or uh, IPs. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Dewan Kehutanan Nasional. Because they have a, a kamar pengusaha. And interestingly, they welcome the Constitutional Court ruling. They welcome. And they say this may be a good ground to solve the land conflict that they are facing. They realize there is no any adequate measure to resolve the land conflict because the policy was fake. 
I mean, they are, will be happy to recognize that. But on the other hand, they have no basis for you know, letting people to have their territory and deal with the corporations with the same level as a negotiation. No. But that, that the representatives and the way they represent their answer for the court ruling is not representative at all. It's they are. But that's the only way I can answer your question, my friend. Second about the role of the Red Plus in order to respond to that. Um, for me, the way it was framed as a customary territory, as indigenous struggle, as the you know, hak masyarakat ada, that it, 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 it's a language that uh, the social movement used and then the state institutions has developed the arguments to you know, um, change the articles within the forestry law because they are has no repertoire for forest tenure reform. So the only way to do forest tenure reform there is, um, in terms of ownership is by bringing in the concept of kepemilikan masyarakat hukum adat. That the indigenous ownership come into the play. Um, when we when we started to think about how how Red Plus respond for that, it's very interesting when I um, asked the uh, the drafter of the strategy national Red Plus, and in the strategy national Red Plus there is a statement that the recognition of the indigenous territories or land will be based on the existing regulation. The problem is the existing regulation. You cannot work with that. It's like the, the denial. How you can rely on the denial regulations for doing the truly recognitions? No, that's a trick. You, know, you have to change the regulation first. But we don't have it. So how the, the good intention of the people from the Red Plus could work, on the other hand, follow the rules, on the other hand, they have to you know, change the rules. No, they cannot do that. They have no firm answer for this dilemma. And it's why, that, that's why in the this, in this stranas, the statement is so ambiguous about this. Thank you. Thanks, Professor. Aganga? Yeah. <coughs> okay, thank you. Thank you for good questions, actually. The, let me respond the first questions from Ibu Jashia, I think. Uh, China's case is very interesting in many sense. It's not only because of the scale, but because of the, the way the reform is unfolding in China. It's interesting to learn and understand. Matter, uh, but do they really matter or not? So what type of data, who collects the data, and what is the politics of that particular data is very, very important. At one level, we talk about the more reformist, progressive side of governmentality and governance. Yet when you look at the numbers, even if we have like four or you know, three to four different types of state-sponsored tenural instruments, like village forest, community forest, community plantation forest, and all of that, when you really look at the number, it really doesn't make a big, big difference, and the targets are not really fulfilled. So what does that really say about the relationship between state and governance and locality, okay? The other thing is that we touched a little bit on private sector. At one point, we say that the private sector has an upper hand when there is, in fact, insecure tenure. On the other hand, we're also saying that they will be more than willing to invest if you had secure tenure. Uh, I think what is important is this impetus that comes in from private capital, private investment, private sector, and trade and consumptions related to it, has to be seen from a perspective of fairness and accountable investment and with transparency. So to what extent 
investments can in fact have those safeguards, those accountability measures and all. That's important. I think these uh, are things that even if the constitutional court decides on this and at the local level it is implemented and operationalized, uh, I'd like to thank each one of you, panel members, and you all, uh, and also to uh, my uh, co-sponsors and co-organizers in Kamitraan C4 Rights and Resources Initiative. Uh, sorry we went a little bit overboard. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs>